six. And um, it's really close to, you know, what James is saying, humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. And, uh, because it's in, his, it's in view of Him that we are humbled. It's in view of Him that we see life. It's, it's only in view of Christ that we see anything true and of reality. This good to go, Jimmy? Yeah, just the one. Aren't both of them supposed to be on? Okay, it's on. It's it's on. All right, I got it. It's in Hosea chapter six, verse one and two. Um, I love that section there because it's it's uh, it's speaking of the resurrection. That day, that third day, He will raise us up, and uh, it's the day of the Lord. It's the day of Christ. We've all been taught of man that the day of Christ is something off in the future, but. Um, Hosea is declaring that to be as in the third day he shall raise us up. And um, I'm just, uh, this year I feel like my heart is uh, arrested or confronted or uh, with the brightness of the day that Jesus is, the light that he is. And um, let me write some stuff on the board. Oh, I just have a lot of verses to share with you guys today. Things that you've heard before. I'm just just uh, I feel like the clarity of it is really striking in me that the that Jesus is the day and he is the light of reality and of truth and that all that is of man is is darkness and and uh, and it's no coincidence in the in the first in the very beginning of this natural creation of this natural realm, there was darkness and then there was light. And that's just the order. And, um, and, it, and it comes to be fulfilled in the new covenant. Um, I'm going to write darkness. There's a lot of statements in the, especially in Isaiah, The Father is speaking in Isaiah, and, and he's and he declares Christ, Jesus Christ, to be the, our covenant with God. Um, in Isaiah forty nine verse eight, in uh, in Isaiah forty two, right in the the first six verses there. Uh, another one that I was reading just recently. Let me find it. The Lord says. This is my covenant. I, this is my covenant with them. My spirit. And uh, I see all that gathered up in things like the name of the Lord. Yahweh. It means I am.
and the Lord in who he is, he's just he's really confronting my heart with the fact that he is all I am. And that is, you know, it, and, it, and it, it is the ministry of, it is the, the just the expression of, of the Lord himself in such a way that, you know, it, 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 the way it hits me is, I am, you are not. I am that I am. I am, I live. He's, he's our only life. I see that in the name of the Lord in some ways represented in the New Covenant. When I see Him, I see Him as the fullness of everything that God has ever declared, promised. And Christ in you is that. And, um, and then, but over here in the Old Covenant, in my own darkened understanding, um, I had a view of the, of the Lord as the Lord. And... Um, and there's a perfect and pure expression of and knowing of the of him as the Lord and Adonai. But um and in my studies I've I just run across things I don't know. I've been looking at a lot of Hebrew this year, and one of the things that I found was was uh before before Jesus came, the Jews decided to conceal the name Yahweh. Because they, they, the, the name that means I am was said to be too holy to speak. And, um, and so the, the Jews, well, they would, they would uh, the Hebrews just all consonants, and they would, they, they would slip the, the vowels from Adonai between these words so that when people even read the scriptures, they wouldn't say the words Yahweh. They wouldn't say the word I am, but they would only say Lord. They would only say Adonai instead. And... Um, in a lot of our, in all of our, almost all of our modern translations, uh, the name Yahweh is concealed, and uh, some of the literal translations say Jehovah, but that's just, it's just the mixture between this Yahweh and and Adonai. It's not even a word that was inspired or came out anywhere from the heart of God, and um, and my point in all this is that it's really telling and and uh, not surprising that what man does with the Word of God is conceal there's something of knowing him as just Lord and us as a servant uh, and that relationship that falls short of him living um, and so in the new covenant you know the Lord says no longer have I called you I haven't, I haven't called you servants but I've called you friends henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all things I have heard of my Father, and I have made known to you. And uh, anyway, I just, I, I just see that as a major a contrast between the old and the new, and, and, the, and, and just who he is when, when, the, when the Lord reveals himself as our very life. It is to the putting away of all that we are. You're just, this is Galatians 4. But I say to you, for so long a time that the heir is an infant, he being Lord of all, he does not differ anything from a slave, but he's under the guardians and housemasters until the term set by the Father. So we also... When we were infants, we were under elements of the world being enslaved. He's talking about the law. He's talking about the old covenant and that servant and lordship relationship. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son having come into being out of a woman having come under the law, that he might redeem the ones under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, or Daddy, Father, so that 
you no more are a slave but a son and also an heir of God through Christ. The fullness of time came. That's the finished work of Christ. That, uh, this transition from this, from this darkness to the day of the age, to the, to the light of the truth, it's come by the work of Christ. Now, we're all in different places as far as our participation in the day. Um, but as far as God is concerned, it's something that's fully established. The day has come. And I, I, I just want to share with you some verses that, that uh, really bring, it, at least in my heart, I'm, I'm being confronted with the, when I say the day of the age, I'm quoting from Young's literal translation. This is the last the last verse in 2 Peter. Let me find it. It has to do with the appearing of Christ. We have... No, this is not it. That's a good one, though. We have something more sure than the prophetic word, to which we do well to pay attention as to a light shining in a dark place till the day dawns and the morning star rises in our hearts. Peter's last message in 2 Peter is, Increase ye in grace, in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him is the glory, both now and to the day of the age. That's Young's literal. I think your translation is, you're, you're going you're gonna to be used to seeing forever. To the day of eternity, to the day, to the day forever. But that day is the day of Christ, and it's, and it's really literally the day of the age. Jesus spoke of two ages. Here's an example. I'm reading from Matthew. I'm sorry, Mark chapter 10, verses 29 and 30. Truly I say to you, there's no one who's left house or brothers or sisters or mothers or father or children or lands for my sake and for the sake of the gospel who will not receive a hundred, hundredfold now in this time. And in the eight... and they will receive them with persecution, and in the age to come, eternal life. If you have eternal life, you're, you're living in the new covenant age. This is, this is very simple. It's as simple as the Old and New Testament, Old and New Covenant. Much of the church doesn't know what time it is. They are not knowing the time and what, and what day it is. The writer of Hebrews told us when the age, came, when the first age came to an end, he told us when all the ages came to an end. He's talking about the cross. He says, now, once, for all, at the completion of the ages, he has been manifested for the putting away of sin through the sacrifice of himself. I'm, I'm quoting from Hebrews 9, verse 26. So that's the LITV. That's Jay Green's. Uh, the other, there's Young's literal says, at the full end of the ages. At the end of the ages. At the, at, at the cross. Jesus brought an end to the first 
that he may establish the second. And that's established by the appearing of Christ in our hearts, by the, the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ shining in our hearts. In Psalm 118, it's, it's written, this is the day that Yahweh has made. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Let's look at the, the you know, what is being said here in Psalm 118, verse, starting in verse 23. The stone which the builders rejected has become the head cornerstone. We're talking about the cross here. The rejection of Christ, the foundation of all that is God's reality. The stone the builders rejected is the head of the cornerstone, and this is Yahweh's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. May the, may the Spirit of God make, make His appearing marvelous in the eyes of your heart, in the eyes of your understanding. So that's what He's speaking about here. He's not talking about a 12-hour a period of light that you know we're so often used to hearing this is the day and so we ought, we ought to pump ourselves up and, and, and put a smile on and you know that sort of thing. Um, what the, the psalmist is writing about here is about the cross and the, and the coming of Christ and the truth that is the light that he is in your, in your soul. Increase in grace in the knowledge of our Lord. That's increasing in His own knowing and in His own understanding. The cross is not a... And, and it's not an event. I'm not saying that... Because the cross is a person. The cross is the presence of Christ he uh, when he came at his baptism the father declared this is my son in whom I'm well pleased God was satisfied before Jesus had done one miracle before Jesus had done one thing in this realm God was satisfied because the life, the divine, eternal life of God was made manifest and was present. And Jesus confirms that. In, in uh, Matthew 11, he says, the law and the prophets prophesied until John. John the Baptist, he's talking about there. Uh, and, and so it's his coming. It's his presence that's enough. The law and the prophets prophesied until he appears. And that heart that appeared was none other than the very image of the invisible God. Even before the cross, even before that heart was manifest in, in, in Golgotha, He was present. And so, the, you know, the, the end of the first, the It, it has to do with his presence and his and and then even more even in his living in his people in his body the church that day brings a full end of the first man and only and only Christ is glorified only the son lives and that's the new covenant it's him living it is not I but Christ There's, we are all so familiar with these Galatians 6 14 God forbid that I should glory except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ there's no place for glorying there's no place for boasting there's no there's no room for self-expression in the new covenant because he is the life. He's the one living. Okay, here's Isaiah 42, verse 8. I am 
Yahweh. That means I am. I am, I am. That is my name. I give my glory to no other, nor my praises to carved idols. This is right after the Father says, I will give thee as a covenant to the people. There's a wonderful rest in us seeing this person who is our covenant. I was, uh, I can't remember the verse, the address, but I was looking at how the Lord spoke to, to Abraham. And he said, I make my covenant with thee and with thy seed hereafter. The Father's covenant has always been with Christ. And he has put the person of the new covenant in you as your very life. And that is a very secure relationship. That relationship is as perfect as Jesus Christ is perfect. That relationship is the seed that cannot be corrupted. And it's a security that we can only know by the appearing of Christ. I live and it is filled the whole earth with the glory of Yahweh. Numbers 14. You know, but we, ha we all have a blindness in us uh, in our We all have things that we think we can bring to the table, bring to this relationship. And, um, and that's just where I've been experiencing, the, where my heart has been arrested in, in, uh, in view of him. So that I, I can't bring anything to this. I can only see this one. And I'm, I'm, I'm just really enjoying the liberty of that. And I'm hoping to share some of that with you. I, I really uh, feel like the Lord's dealing with me about knowing that he, he is the one who has initiated in everything of God. We love him because he first loved us. He's the initiator. Uh, someone recently asked me, one of my neighbors, he says, you love the Lord, don't you? And, uh, and I just had to say, the love of God's in me. And, um, and I know that's pathetic. I, just, I, I remember singing worship songs and uh, things like, I want to love you, Lord. And thinking, yeah, boy, I can't sing that to the Lord. If I, what, what, what if I told my wife, I want to love you, honey? <laughs> so, wow. Uh, You know what? It's a pathetic, cold heart that has to say that to the Lord. But that's, that's, that's what I am. I mean, I, I just, I, uh, I don't have any love except that love that Christ is. And, uh, and that's a fact. I see that in the face of the Lord. But, you know, my, my lack and my, my uh, is not the issue because I'm soil. I'm, I'm, there's nothing... I don't know. All these statements just come to come to heart when I when I uh, they say it better than I can. We love him because he first loved us. That love is Christ. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draw him. Song of Solomon one, verse four says, "Draw me, and after thee we run." I like the order here. Draw. And then, after we run, he's the source. He's the initiator of the love of God. The love of Christ constrains us. Having thus judged that if one died for all, then all died. In Christ, our own self-efforts, our fleshly energies are not constraining us. It's Christ. You're held fast in this person because of Christ in you, because of who He is, because you are born of God, because Christ is in you. 
Your fear of the Lord is not what constrains you. Your willpower, your self-discipline, these are not the constraining power. It is love. His love. It's Him. We love Him because He first loved us. And He loved us by dying our deaths, by bringing us and all that we try to bring to the table. Isaiah 53, verse 8. Who shall declare his generation? He was cut off out of the land of the living, and for the transgressions of my people he was stricken, and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his deaths. Your, uh, your translations won't, won't say deaths, plural, but the Hebrew there, the word is plural. The Jews have long pulled this word out and said, oh wait, he died deaths. This is, you know, the Jews have always, always argued that the suffering servant of, of uh, Isaiah 53 was Israel, not, not Jesus. And so they, they've pulled this verse out and try to make it some sort of proof that, that this was not one man. But the reality of it is that the one man died for all. And the reason it's plural is because he died all our deaths. That's what's being declared here. Moses made a serpent of bronze and he lifted it up on the ensign. And it hath been that if the serpent has bitten any man, he looked expectantly unto this serpent of brass, he lived. It's a, it's, it's a wonderful testimony here that Jesus will come and, and bring out in John chapter 3, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. And if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men. This is... This testimony declares that God's people look to live. They see reality and they experience life. When we are made to look expectantly to Christ, the person of cr the cross, we see that the cross displays the death of a serpent. Why would, why would the Father depict Jesus as a snake? In seeing Him, we face the severity of God. Because we see that God has declared all the first man, Adam, to be one with the enemy. When we see him, we see God's view of the work of the cross. We see that the old man and that nature, the devil, has been cast out. Even drawn into that death and executed. Why would the Father show us the Son in the form of a serpent except to show us that all mankind was put to death? There and then. Jesus never sinned. Jesus took on the form of a serpent when he drew all man into the judgment of the cross. And so in this testimony, Jesus is not the one the Father seeing. It's us. His wrath was poured out on you, on me. There, then, God saw our deaths. And it was out from this understanding that we have the gospel. Paul says, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. And so in seeing the cross, we're made to see the severity of God and that the cross was against us, against all man and against the natural life of our soul. And we can just accept this intellectually, and it will seem good and right, but when the Holy Spirit shows us this in the face of Jesus Christ, it's, it's a traumatic thing, and it needs to happen in every heart. Every heart needs to see their end right here. Every heart needs to, uh, the prophets talked about eating the word of God and that it was sweet in their mouth, but it became sour. 
in their belly and they ingested it. This can only happen by the, by the revelation of Christ. What I mean is when we see Him, we are completely undone, truly devastated. And because we are made to know the full weight of knowing that we don't just commit sins in the old identity in the first man and according to the flesh, we are sin. We don't just deserve execution, but we've all been crucified with Christ. That day will not come unless the falling away, the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, the one opposing and exalting himself over everything being called God or the object of worship. So as for him to sit in the temple of God as God, setting forth himself, declaring he is God. I'm, now, I'm confident that that day has come in the hearts of those that are here in different measures, but it's just the very, it's just the simplicity of the gospel and uh, Galatians 2.20, that it's that I am that old man, I am that first man, and that that old man has been put away. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. He loved me, and he gave himself for me. And as we continue on with the word, we're seeing both the severity towards the first and the goodness of God. And that God has accomplished this. And having executed the judgment of the world. That's what we're talking about, the judgment of the world. Jesus is talking about the cross. When, he, when Lord Jesus gives us his view of the judgment, he says, now is the judgment of this world, and now is the prince of this world cast out. If I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. I'm often sharing stuff that uh, overlaps with all this false teaching that is in the Christian community concerning the future, concerning the coming of the Lord. And that stuff needs to come to an end in the face of Christ. And this is the, uh, all these, all these future, future expectations of the judgment, they need to come first to what Christ has accomplished. This is, this is the declaration that's, that was in the apostles. For it's, it's time for judgment to begin with the house of God. And if it first begin with us, where does it begin? We're, the, the, the church is the first to come to the judgment. And it's salvation. He has appeared so that we can live through Him. He is our life. And, and Christ in you is the better resurrection. Better than getting our old identity back according to the flesh. He is, he is our head. He is one new man. He is the resurrection in that there is no other life living in a people. Paul's talking about the day in uh, the end of Romans chapter, it's in Romans chapter 13. He talks about how the night is far spent, the day is at hand. He talks about living in the resurrection, he says, it, in, in that passage. I'll read it later. It's the day of the new covenant. It is the day of Christ. It's the light of the truth. It is only seen in the face of Jesus Christ.
And God, you know, may the, may the Lord continue to arrest our, our hearts in view The Spirit of God is the initiator of, of this relationship. He's the author and the finisher of all the things of God. Not the soul, not man, not the flesh. And yet still religion says you must. You must daily crucify your flesh. Keep it from coming back to life again. You must cultivate a hunger and a thirst. You must become thirsty again. But Jesus said everyone who's drinking of this water shall thirst again. But whoever may drink of the water that I give him will never thirst again. To the age, the literal translation says. The water that I give him shall become in him a well of water springing up to life, eternal. This is God's life living. Sure, there's waiting on the Lord but we wait on the Lord because we can't make anything happen. Our standing, our waiting, our quietness, our anything is never the cause of Him revealing Himself. It's in His rest that you are seated. Square one is beginning at the place where we know that apart from Him, we can do nothing. And so we're completely dependent on Him to draw us that we may know Him. By whom we have access through faith into this grace wherein you stand. Rejoice in the hope, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of Him. Ephesians 3, 12. When Moses saw Yahweh in the burning bush, the whole encounter begins with God revealing Himself. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in the flame of a fire and out of the midst of a bush. He looked and behold, the bush was burning and it was not consumed. That's, that's Exodus 3 verse 2. Now some of the translations, the way they say it, like Young's literal, or I'm sorry, the New Living, it says things like, uh, it's got Moses bravely declaring, I must step aside and see this great sight. But literally, the way it reads, it's Young's literal. Moses says to the Lord, let me turn aside, I pray thee, and see this great appearance. It's like Peter saw the Lord walking on the water. And Peter asks, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. And so Jesus says, come. The thing, it came from Him. He's the initiator. He's the source. Moses, knowing the same, that it can only originate with God, he says, now let me turn aside that I might see this great sight. That's a shocking Bible. Moses didn't turn aside to become a good person. He didn't turn aside so that he could have an amazing supernatural experience. He turned aside to see the Lord, to know the Lord. Now this is repentance, true repentance. Moses was granted repentance in the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. That's Ephesians 1.17. And so, he came. And then, and then Yahweh says, do not come near, take off your sandals from off your feet, for the place on which you're standing is holy ground. So something, something's not allowed here. Something had to be lost. And the and the loss is the response to the place of perfection and holiness that he's already been brought onto or into. And that's the order. Moses is now on holy ground. And too often it's, it's said that this is about how Moses had to give something up before he could go on with the Lord. 
but that's out of order. Draw me. And then after thee we run. First the Father made himself known, and then Moses was transformed in view of reality. This, his increase produces our decrease. The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. And that's the order. And just as light removes darkness, so the things of man are removed in his presence. And if our giving up of things is done in any attempt to get ourselves onto holy ground, then it's out of order. We're the initiator. We're and, and that life can't come here. It's a nature that says, I will ascend. I will make my throne like the Most High. I will be like God. You may be familiar with those words in, in Isaiah chapter 14. It's the nature of the enemy. When we come to him out of order, it's of man. And, uh, and we're barred from the presence. Moses' sandals weren't sinful. It's just that they were of man. They're, I don't know how else to say. I'm going to say man-made walking instruments. Uh, our former conversation, our former manner of life. We're so quick to just say, well, that's, oh, that's about our behavior. What's got to change is our behavior. But the manner of life is the, about the life and, that is animating that heart and energizing who you are. It's about self-living. That is the former manner of life that has to be put off. I'm, I'm going to read from uh, Ephesians 4. This is verses 20 and 24. This is a Weiss, the Weiss translation. I really like uh, this translation because it brings out... I did some studies this year about the aorist tense form. We don't have this tense form in, in English, and it's a, it's a very big picture. Greek is a very descriptive language. Um, if we had a way to say, like, you put, a, you put a satellite out in orbit, and it's permanently in a certain fixed position in orbit, and you would describe that, that it's in a present state because of a finished work, because, because of all the calculations and the rockets that got it into certain, a certain altitude at a certain rate of speed and all that stuff, and then it was done. It's there. I mean, some of those satellites will stay there for 10,000 years uh, before they finally degrade. But I'm just saying that there's, there is this present condition that we are in as a result of the work of Christ. And it's, and it's a place of perfection that needs no maintenance. It's something that God has accomplished in Christ. Anyway, there's a tense form in the Greek that describes the whole thing from the beginning to the end. Because you're in, you're in, you're in this state because of a, of a finished work. And um, uh, this brother, Kenneth Weiss, Kenneth Weiss, he was a Greek scholar at Moody Bible Institute and he, he really tries to bring that out in his translation. Um, this is all about putting off the former man. And, and uh, the way it's properly expressed is because of what Christ has done. In him you were taught just as the truth is in Jesus that you have put off once and for all with reference to your former manner of life, the old self, which is being corrupted according to the passionate desires of deceit. Moreover, that you are being constantly renewed with reference to the spirit of your mind that you have put off, here it is again, once for all. I'm sorry, that you have put on, once for all, the new self, who is after God, who was created in righteousness, holiness, and truth. This errorist tense form also is expressed when, when the scriptures talk about the daily cross, our daily death. It is the result of a finished work. Everything that we, every death that you may experience daily is 
is only a seeing and an accepting of the one death that is once and for all. Listen, here's, here's, here's uh, Luke 9.23. It's, again, this is the Weiss translation. Assuming that anyone desires to come after me as a follower of mine, let him disregard his own interests. Let him at once, once for all, pick up and carry his cross day after day. Let him take the same road with me that I take as a habit of life. The way in this daily death is a part, it's, it's, it's only a true death with Christ if it's coming out of a finished work and it's based on the foundation of what Christ has done. You are dead. Your life is hidden with Christ and God. And if there's any declaration of dying again or it's a false cross. It's him living. And the, the blindness of religion, it just can't see past this outward realm, this natural realm. And so the message is just always going to be about changing behaviors from bad to good. It'll always be about you must, you must crucify your flesh and keep it from coming back to life again. But when the person of the gospel appears in you, you see fulfillment, fullness, a completed salvation that is eternally settled in heaven. And it becomes all about the divine life of Jesus Christ living instead of us, instead of our life, living for God and having self-expression. It's an exodus out from one man and into another. In Luke 9, 29, I was reading this, this LITV. Jay Green's got a literal translation. It says uh, that on the Mount of Transfiguration, Elijah appeared, Moses appeared talking with Jesus. And it says, appearing in glory, they spoke of his exodus which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. And I just, I really got, I get a lot out of that because, well, the, the Greek word is exodus. It's right out of, I mean, they're taking it right out of the Hebrew. There isn't, your translations are going to say about his departure. Jesus is leaving. This, this, this word is so rich in meaning because it gathers up all that God did in the exodus in, in, in translating all of God's people out of a slavery and into the freedom that His Son is, into the freedom that God's view is. God declaring to Moses, go tell Israel, Israel's my son, to let my son go that he may worship me. And the freedom that is in this one, it's, it's all there and it's all being gathered up in this. And it says... He spoke of his exodus, which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. Jesus accomplished an exodus out of the first man, Adam. He, he, he has delivered us out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. And, uh, and, and of course, Peter says... Oh, it's good for us to be here. We're going to make three temples, tabernacles to three of them. Anyway, speaking in ignorance, we, we do that. We bring our ignorance. But the Lord brought down the cloud, and the voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my beloved Matthew 17, 8 says, And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus. That's what the, the unveiling Christ goes. That's where, that's where the Spirit of God is, is bringing us with this, where we see no man save Jesus alone. This is, the God, this is God's eye view of salvation. No man except Jesus only living.
The first man, Adam, is excluded in the presence of the second. Even the law and the prophets are excluded here. The words of that testimony. There is no other name under heaven by whom men can be saved, not Moses, not Elijah. Jesus Christ is the only vehicle of salvation. He is the man. Unto this man will I look. It says in Isaiah 66. And no other way, any other way is impossible. It doesn't even matter if you're rich in good things like kindness and gentleness and love. They are the riches and abilities that we can't bring here according to the flesh. <clears throat> Jesus says, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, then who can be saved? Jesus looking up on them, he says, with men it's impossible. But not with God. For with God all things are possible. It's the Holy Spirit deals with me over and over and over again to just have to, I have to hear how it's impossible for me to do this. It's impossible for me to be this. It's impossible for me. And I find the grace of God in that. And, I, and uh, anyway, I find a wonderful dealing of that. And uh, it's just the natural mind to be astonished beyond measure that God would make it impossible for man to achieve salvation. And it just boggles the natural mind that our failure was designed by God. The rich man that Jesus is talking about here is the heart that's rich in his own self-sufficiency. Salvation is impossible for that man. For man altogether. And it can only be found in one man, in Christ. The, in the finished work of Christ, only one can be glorified. Self can only push for his own glory. We are often opposed to the mindset that the way of salvation has to be difficult and hard. I, I get this all the time when I share with people. What you're saying is too easy. And you know, they, they, uh, recently someone brought this verse out. and they, This is the English Standard Version. Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. You guys, this is not a good rendering of what Jesus is saying. Uh, uh, this translation is really misconstruing what Jesus said here. Uh, the contrast that Jesus makes in this statement has to do with the narrowness of salvation that's in one man in Christ, the constricted uh, place that is Christ Himself. It has to do with the narrowness and the broadness. It's not about hard and easy. That would be a complete contradiction to my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Come unto me. And the hardest truth is the easiest. It's hard for us. Jesus is the one thing that God has always declared. There is no contradiction in His mind. The cross is only hard for us to receive because it is His cross that is the easy yoke. The narrowness of salvation is all about how eternal life is found in only one new man. The narrowness of that way is only constricted in proportion to how immensely impossible it is for man to attain salvation by his own sufficiency and his own ability, by his own merit. The gate was only tight upon entrance and narrow. And if you can see it in his appearing, you've been brought through this door and into an unimaginably wide place. In Christ, you are in the new creation. When the apostle says, you are created in Christ Jesus unto good works, you have been... That creation is Christ. It is Christ living. It is the resurrection living in a people. 
It is one new man. It is a, it is a new heaven, a new earth. It's, the, it's the, the whole world that God the Father always saw when he says, he's speaking to Abraham and he says, look to the heavens, so shall your seed be. He, and that's Matthew, I'm sorry, that's Genesis 15. In Genesis 13 he said, as the dust of the earth, so shall your seed be. The Father has very, very consistently declared Christ to be a heaven and earth. His whole, is the whole realm of reality that He is. It's one that we abide in and we experience as the eternal inheritance only by, only by the revelation of Christ and by the ministry of the Holy Spirit can we, the eyes of our heart be enlightened and we know and abide and rest in this realm who is Christ. I love this little, these literal translations. I just wanted to just read in closing. This is the LITV and how, you know, just to, to reemphasize how literally salvation is the exodus out of Adam and into Christ. John 4 39, and many of the Samaritans out of that city believed into him. The one who hears my word and believes the one who has sent me has a everlasting life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. John 5, 24. This is John 6, 35. I am the bread of life. The one coming to me will not at all hunger. And the one believing into me will never, ever thirst. John 6, 47 and 48. Truly, truly, I say to you, the one believing into me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. John 7, 38. The one believing into me, as the scriptures said, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. John 11, 25 and 26. I am the resurrection and the life. The one believing into me, though he die, he shall live. And everyone living and believing into me shall not ever die forever. Jesus cried out and said, The one believing into me does not believe into me, but into the one sending me. It's John 12, 44. I have come as a light to the world that everyone who believes into me may not remain in darkness. Father, reveal your Son in us, that we may walk in the light as you, as your Son is in the light. Amen. That's a good stopping point, y'all.